organized by Mr. Sayed Mohsin Khadri. Uh, I think uh, you can take over the session, Mr. Sayed Mohsin, and he will discuss on the role of clinical pharmacist in cardio emergencies and the patient and caregiver counseling tip for the cardiovascular patients. Um, I think, uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, yes, you're well audible. And my, yeah, and my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so let me introduce very small, uh, like two minutes. Uh, I'm Sayed Mohsin. I'm practicing uh, uh, pharmacist in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Dhabi. And I'm practicing here more than 11 years. And I'm academically an M farm uh, in pharmacy practice. And I'm also a preceptor for postgraduate uh, clinical pharmacy student uh, for our residency here in Abu Dhabi. So to me, the thank you everyone, Dr. Sudhakar and, and Dr. Ajit for allowing me to present. And we have seen all the sessions which are uh, clinical oriented. Now I'll be saying that what role of clinical pharmacist in cardio emergencies, you know, um, to give you a different flavor to, to the uh, workshop today. Um, before starting uh, uh, this lecture, I, I always wanted to, to uh, I always have uh, communicated with many um, uh, pharmacist you know, in India and then they were saying that uh, not many job prospects in hosp Indian hospitals and then um, no good remuneration and less people understand what we are supposed to do and lack of experienced clinical pharmacists who can train future workforce you know these are the common problems which uh, our budding clinical pharmacists uh, you know face uh, in the uh, usually uh, in all this this one so the outline of my presentation will be like statistics of cardiovascular disease uh, cardiovascular emergencies, what clinical pharmacists do in ED, and then what are clinical responsibilities, what are administrative responsibilities, and how to position oneself in cardiology as a clinical pharmacist. And how to do a value-based services uh, which can be built to the hospital, to the patients, and to the insurance companies. Um, so cardiovascular disease, some worries, worrisome stats, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about by now, by looking uh, at, uh, by going through all the presentations uh, till now. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally. 17.9 uh, million people died from CVD in 2019. Low and medical, mid, middle income countries are disproportionately affected with over 75% of cardi uh, cardiovascular deaths occurring in these regions and economic burdens uh, is uh, constitutes to around hundreds of billions of dollars annually. So what are the cardiac emergencies? Already this has been discussed very elaborate by the experts. I may not go into this one. So do we really need clinical pharmacists in cardio emergencies, you know? So um, by the end of presentation, I may give a little idea that how, what skills clinical pharmacists do pro uh, possess and then how you can utilize them in cardiac emergencies. So this, Definitely the physicians are overburdened in any emergency care. Definitely there is a many uh, high equity situations going on, overburdened, more than multiple patients catering uh, by limited number of resources. So definitely sometimes it can be very daunting. So this was a study done in uh, Poland and three uh, emergency departments were discussed and the spectrum of physicians involved were interns, internists, surgical physicians, junior physicians, uh, residents, registrants, senior specialists, consultants, etc., etc. So, so in all the EDs, they were uh, in ED one there were sixty four observations, ED two ninety six observation, and ED three is sixty five uh, observations, which constitutes a few hundred hours of their time. So, when you look at this, a typical presentation uh, from uh, an emergency point of view is non medical related clinical or administrative tasks were around eighty five percent. Whereas the medication related tasks constitute only for, for around 15%, 9.4 9 uh, in ED1, 7.4 in ED2, and in total it was like around 15%. So once the, the investigator interviews, uh, interviewed the physicians who were working in, uh, in ED department, um, there were two approaches were made. Physician who wanted clinical pharmacist and physician who were a little bit hesitant to include clinical pharmacists in emergency department. So in first session, there were some of the responders say that the clinical pharmacists provide work relief, medication reconciliation time is time consuming and pharmacists can effectively do that. And uh, medication reconciliation sometimes um, uh, is like a detective work which takes lots and lots of time from physicians other activities. 
Whereas when they look into physicians who were hesitant to include clinical pharmacist in ED, where like this medical for some physicians, more common with the junior physicians, that time uh, that medication reconciliation is not a priority. And, uh, and some of the physicians also raise the concern that we are already doing medication reconciliation, but why do you need other people to do that one? And physical barriers, because uh, sometimes the, the ER department can be very uh, uh, congested and, and, and uh, physical space is constrained. So that's why they don't want another member who is not imparting uh, greatly to the clinical care of the patients. And fear of interference. This fear of interference were very common with junior physicians because they identified medication recon through medication reconciliation. It's a learning opportunity for, opportunity for them. And if you have a person who are doing and they are not, not the one who are doing, so they, their learning curve is uh, somewhat not up to the optimal mark. Now, what the main insights from this study, medication reconciliation was the only medication related task systematically done for all patients by all physicians. This indicates that there are room for future clinical pharmacists uh, to do systematically and contribute with medic other medication related tasks in ED. Drug logistics is, plays an important role in emergency department when you, when, when physician wants to give an, an, a, a drug and you can't find it in the emergency uh, department. And some of the hospitals very common in Indian healthcare that there is a no concept of inpatient pharmacies, whereas in Western part of the world, you have a well-organized inpatient pharmacies to, to address the situation of drug logistics. Uh, the study also provides knowledge on how ED physicians perceive the implementation of future ED pharmacies, where acceptance were on the greater, um, um, greater side, whereas hesitation and concern were also identified among the participants. Now, coming back to what actually pharmacists do in ED or what they can do if possess right skills. So typical patient journey, patient arrival, clinical assessment is done by physician, nurses, and other uh, healthcare professionals. Medication therapy ordered, medication administered. Patient is reassessed, then either the patient is discharged in stabilized condition or admission to inpatient or referred to a super specialty. Um, uh, the rele sorry, relevant uh, specialty care. Elements of pharmacy interventions, which involve medication reconciliation, medication review, drug therapy recommendations, guide drug administration, and teaching and counseling to the patients and relatives. What is the, the, the responsibilities are divided into two categories broadly, clinical responsibilities as, as well as the medication, uh, the, uh, sorry, administrative responsibilities. So direct patient care, medical drug information or medication information, resuscitation, um, which is not very common still in the Western part of the world. Uh, high alert medication and their procedures, medication procurement and preparations, medication order review, medication therapy monitoring and documentation. So administrative responsibility include the insurance of uh, uh, medication safety, performance and quality improvement, emergency preparedness, interdisciplinary education, training the pharmacist work show, uh, workforce and research and professional development. So direct patient care means presence of uh, emergency medicine pharmacies ensure reducing medication error. Why? Because because of the high equity, they are likely to chance and uh, that um, medication errors are happening. And in some of the institutes, we also identified here in emergency that medication errors are commonly happening in ER settings uh, because there are uh, increased workload, uh, many sound alike, look alike medications. And ER is the department where high alert medications are used a lot. Critical for uh, emergency medication pharmacists to be involved in direct patient care activities, including medication selection and the prescribing processes. Um, clinical pharmacists are most effective in doing when they are physically present in the ED. Uh, and also they should triage to focus their patient efforts than who, who categorize the patient with critical illness or urgent medication need on high risk medic patient populations or on specific class of medications most associated with medication errors like anticoagulants. Now, prevalence and categorization of drug-related problems in emergency department. Any patient who comes in, this was the study done uh, and published in Journal of Emergency Medica Medicine. So among 1,039 patients screened for drug-related problems, for the medicine, for the, for the doctors here, drug-related problems are usually seven, uh, untreated indication, indication uh, and uh, drug without an indication, adverse drug reaction, subtherapeutic dose, overdose, adverse drug reaction, and drug-drug interactions. So among which around 30% were found to have at least one drug related problem, which resulted in, in their ED visit. Commonly implicated drug classes were cardiovascular medica medications, uh, around 26%, uh, 
anti-infective, which is antimicrobial medications, uh, which constitute 13%, and analgesic medications, which constitutes, again, 13.6%. So prevalence and categorizations uh, of drug-related problems, in, uh, like among the total 443 DRPs detected, commonly identified categories were adverse drug reactions, which were un under-recognized and under-reported. Uh, in, even in our hospital, we, we, we struggled to, to get them reported. And this is very essential because adverse drug reaction, no one would like to uh, uh, report. When we inquire about why it is not being reported and uh, the, the physicians, pharmacies, nurses, they said they don't have time. But it is very essential for, for the patient care. Uh, ineffective medications constitute the second category, which is like 16% and sub-therapeutic dosage were around 15.3%. So clinical pharmacists led medication reconciliation program in emergency department. Uh, this was observed and published in like recently published one year back in general of pharmacy practice. Um, so the aim of the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of pharmacy-led medication reconciliation in reducing ED visits. So evaluate if it, um, uh, or also a clinical pharmacist reduces medication error. So result, uh, results of the study tell the reduction, reduction in ED visits, cost saving, and prolific amount of errors corrected before occurring. Now coming back, there were three endpoints uh, of this study. Primary endpoint was third day, 30-day uh, ED revisit with the same problem. The secondary endpoint was 60 days ED visits and 90 days AB. So um, in 153 patient with no pharmacist group um, came back to ED in comparison with 88 uh, patients with the clinical pharmacist and 53 patients in secondary endpoint compared to 39 with a, uh, with a clinical pharmacist and 90 uh, day visits were 31 patients in no pharmacist group and 26 patients in the OBS clinical pharmacist group. So next is the providing drug information to the uh, to the physicians, nurses, and also the patients. Most common reason for medication error is lack of information related to medication therapy. The information can be related to broad spectrum of clinical scenarios like medication information need, medication selection, administration, ADRs, and drug drug interactions compatibility. Why said compatibility when you don't have too many lines and you want to infuse too many medications? So clinical pharmacists in, are well positioned to tell you which drug is uh, compatible and what drug is not non compatible. So identification of unknown medication and various toxidromes. Very commonly identified in patients, we don't have any more history and physicians and nurses and pharmacists struggle to get the history. Um, the increased incidence is seeing that when the patient is on herbal medications, OTC medications, which are directly taken from pharmacy without any, any EMR record, you know. And it becomes very uh, much um, simple when you have electronic medical record and it is harmonized across hospitals. Where I work, uh, we have the standalone, um, I, I work in public hospital here in Abu Dhabi and we have a common um, electronic medical record system, which is uh, um, which all the public hospital uses. And also if a patient goes to a private hospital, still I can see the medica um, his medication and also uh, his lab reports and clinical notes, et cetera, which, is, which helps us in, in doing the medication reconciliation to that patient. So highlight medications and procedures, emergency departments and maximum usage of highlight medications apart from ICUs and OTs. Uh, medication involving, uh, medication error involving highlight medication can be catastrophic. And there is one institute uh, which is uh, called as Institute of Safe Medication Practice. It's a US and Canada based organization which provides many gap analysis tools to uh, and their recommendation for medication management and use and pharmacists are often champions in providing such recommendations. In cardiac emergencies, many high alert medications are used like anticoagulants, fibrinolytics, uh, blood products, anesthetics, concentrated electrolytes, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what does literature says for um, an addition of clinical pharmacies? Increase compliance with advanced uh, cardiac life support ACLS guidelines, reduce time to administration of antibodies for patients presenting in sepsis, um, reduce time to analgesia for trauma patient, reduce time to sedation and analgesia for rapid sequence intubation. This is related to uh, drug uh, uh, facilitating the drug logistics, uh, uh, but in particular, and reduce time to thrombolysis for acute ischemic strokes and improve door to balloon time for MI. So medication order review and medication therapy monitoring, as per JCA and many other regulatory agencies, warrants the verification of pharmacists before administering the medications. However, there are some exceptions in emergency settings and OR settings, which you don't require. Where, and in the scenarios where physician directly observe the medication administration, you don't require any pharmacist uh, verification before administering.
Many narrow therapeutic indication medications are prescribed. Therefore, TDM is an essential virtue of a CP. And then they can be a resource person when or how to utilize TDM services as not every patient requires it. Drug-induced disorders can be preemptively recognized by CP, um, but there are usually a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, what are the administrative responsibilities? Make sure the medication safety is uh, uh, is enhanced, where you can develop the system, where you can correct the system based factors, like um, ensure uh, safety protocols are followed, uh, especially in high alert medication, sound alike and look alike medications. Performance and quality, we can develop KPIs on using uh, measures that how to monitor your um, departmental or your clinical pharmacist intervention uh, performance um, in the ED settings and emergency preparedness in case of mass casualties. You need a lot of medications which can be overwhelmed your medical supplies. That's why you can preempt the situation and then uh, get yourself prepared for such a scenario. Uh, interdisciplinary in education, resource person to a clinical team, whether it's physician, pharmacists, nurses, physiotherapists, respiratory technicians, etc., etc., and train the uh, pharmacist workforce. Research and professional development also. Now, certification required to function in cardio emergencies, basic life support, ACLS, advanced life support, PALS. American Academy of Clinical Toxicology Advancement Hazmat Life Support. And emergency neurological life support, these are pharmacy-based uh, clinical skills you would require. And board certification, this is um, offered by uh, American um, Pharmacies Association. It's a standalone body. And then uh, in emergency pharmacies or cardiology clinical pharmacies, and there are various uh, certifications they offer. So key takeaways is like clinical pharmacists are well positioned to be a part of a clinical team in cardio emergencies, can take part in developing institutional protocols and guidelines, can lead the quality initiative to enhance the practice. With the right set of skills, clinical pharmacists can impart a significant role in patient management in cardio emergencies. So any questions or if you want me to take in the chat box so we can move forward for the next presentation. I think you can continue with the next presentation, then we'll answer together. So next presentation is like patient counseling tips in cardiology patients. Um, the outline of production, uh, this presentation will be introduction, background, and patient counseling needs and its impact, various tips for effective counseling. What is not covered in this presentation, like steps for patient counseling, how to introduce the patient, what are the topics you need to cover, et cetera, et cetera, and com communication skills needed for patient counseling. Um, this is what is patient counseling, provide detailed and relevant information to patients regarding uh, prescribed medications, such as their purpose, dosage, route of administration, and duration of therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So why a patient has to be counseled? Patient partnership is essential for optimal pharmaceutical case, which is now a requirement for many accreditation agencies and as well as to, to impart significantly in patient uh, uh, well-being. Directly impacts patient adherence and their well-being, uh, prevents hospital readmission, reduction in medication-related uh, problems, and economically beneficial for both patients, hospitals, and insurances. So impact of discharge patient counseling is like... Most patients will be on polypharmacy, which can be overwhelming. For imagine a patient who is not on any drugs, come to hospitals with some cardio emergencies and get discharged. And he will have like four, five, six medications. It is very difficult to explain to him what, and it can be really confusing to him uh, to be uh, compliant with his uh, medications. So a number of medications are directly proportional to uh, medication non-compliance. So as the number of medications increases, the compliance drops. So initially, when they are newly discharged, they will be very compliant. But once they start to feel well-being, that's how the, the, the compliance drops. So it also impacts uh, like decreased 30-day re hospital readmission, no emergency visit related to heart disease, complex patient needed more counseling, uh, very common with the patients who are advanced age, hearing impairment, uh, vision impairment. Uh, so the patients who are on multiple comorbidities, those are the patients are very difficult to counsel and always make sure that you have to have a read back approach. Once you explain the patient, ask him to explain you back so that he can understand. So despite of your maximum efforts, if the patient is not understanding, it's always advisable to have a caregiver along with the patients 
to to uh, explain uh, uh, such that he or she can understand and and be responsible and accountable for the medication regimen so patient counseling by pharmacist is really impactful and also it reduces the adverse drug events so what does community pharmacist in india think about patient counseling this was the interesting study done a few years back and it was the idea of quoting this study because it has got local relevance it was um, uh, conducted in mysore by jss college so in this, the investigator identified uh, the interview to 250 practicing community pharmacists. 80% agreed that patient counseling is their professional obligation. And 7% of the respondents mentioned that they were trying to give basic information regarding drug use to the patient. Sometimes it's not enough. And then professional satisfaction, which constitutes 43%, patients go with satisfaction and observes in increased sales and also improved patient counsel. However, there were some uh, barriers of patient counseling also inadequate knowledge and confidence because most of the community pharmacies are diploma holders which don't have the regular training of new on new medications um, they also said that some of the physicians are dispensing from their clinics uh, no professional fee for patient counseling a poor response from the patients th this was the maximum uh, number of responses and in inadequate continuous professional development programs so tips for patient counseling should be like um, I will not uh, explain that individually the what you have to do, but on a macro level that how you can be efficient uh, for the patient counseling. So by 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 producing or by uh, disseminating the information through patient information leaflets. Usually the medications have the patient information leaflets, but they are company sponsored, and sometimes the information can be jarring. Patient information can be a good source of reinforcement, uh, which uh, increases their, their compliance. And for a large cardi cardiology center, implementation of patient from information leaflets can be an efficient approach. And information is there with the patient for longer time. And many patients' information leaflets are farmer generated and can't be customized to the patient. And they are available only in English. So regional languages are also important in, in, making the, in disseminating the information to PILs and pictograms. So development and validation of patient information leaflet for coronary heart disease, this was, this was again study done in Mangalore. So hospitals can collaborate with pharmacy institutes who have clinical pharmacy department to develop their own PLs such that the hospitals need not spend much money and then they can be very efficient. Local institute can provide PILs in local language based on the uh, population where they are catering. Uh, from an economic point of view, patient can be sent a barcode to scan on the WhatsApp or WhatsApp business, and they shall be able to download PLs on their smartphones, which can be retained by them for long. And the PLs can also be given high, a hyperlink to book uh, for a consultation if more information needed with the clinical pharmacist. So clinical pharmacists can be utilized for teleconsultation only on medications with nominal consultation charges. So insurance can also be built for, the, uh, for that. You need to have a back proper research and also explain to the insurance that giving the counseling session can reduce the ED visits, which, which can cost insurance more. Um, the smarter approach for insurances can be to, to invest in, in giving the proper information to the patient to make in helping them uh, more uh, medication adherence. There is something called uh, the dispensing the medication to dose administration aids. So these are the single use dose administration aids. In our hospital, we do use it for transplant patients where they can have like 10 to 12 medications. We have around 100 patients for transplant uh, medications. We, we, uh, we make a pill box and dispense to the patients. Anecdotally, they have lesser admission, lower rejection rates, and lower ED visits um, related to either rejection or immunosuppression. They are very, very closely monitored. These are, you can get in amazing on if they have OD dosing, this kind of um, dose administration it helps the patient. Um, and also there are something um, more elaborate dosing or more complex dosing, these also can be used. Provided there are some medications uh, for, uh, which should not be stored in pill boxes, like uh, medications which are having complex dosing system like tapering steroids, uh, anticoagulants like warfarin, which, is, uh, which needs frequent monitoring of INR. And also some of the medications which are hygroscopic in nature. When you're exposed to air, they, they oxidize and they, they absorb moisture. Metformin and Lasix is one among the examples. And also if the, if the patient, some of the vitamin supplements get oxidized when exposed to air and they have unpleasant appearance, though the, the, the shelf life, it does not affect the shelf life of uh, vitamins, but the, it may not be very pleasing to have some spots on vitamin tablets. 
And one tip for pharmacists to, if you are introducing the patient to those administration aids, usually do it in a stepwise manner. So, and because uh, if you put all the medications in the pill box at first go, it will confuse them. The patient or the caregiver has to know that what medications go in which boxes easily. And in case of any brand change, the, the patient has to be informed that this brand has been changed. So we are putting, uh, you have to use instead of this color tablet and this color, uh, uh, the new color tablet or new shape uh, whatsoever. So use of pill organisms can be taught by pharmacists to the patient and their caregivers where extensive counseling is required. Not all the patients to be put on pill um, uh, boxes because uh, not all patients require these dosing. If a patient has got very good cognition skills, very good education background, he may not be put on these uh, pill boxes. Um, helpline for patients when in need, very important because sometimes they can mess up with, with, with the dosing schedule. So at least they should have a, a telephone number or a WhatsApp business or, or any contact modality where pharmacists can be uh, in contact with the patient to explain them very well. Uh, teleconsultation, very, this, this was the study done in Canada, which was a 15 week program, 40 patients were teleconsulted, all healthcare professions, 255 cardiac related issues were identified, 91% were resolved by pharmacists, adverse drug events were, were reduced, prescription errors were also reduced. So uh, dedicated counseling in case of high alert medication for the first time users, example, Duax, Warfarin, and, and nitrates, even though it's not a high alert medications. Compliance for the use of DOAX and warfarin in secondary prevention of stroke. Uh, we have here uh, a dedicated counseling uh, for warfarin and DOAX um, done by clinical pharmacists in which all the lifestyle modification has to be taken care of. Um, it's very common, in a, it's very essential to explain to the patient who are from tier two studies and rural places because if someone is on warfarin, what they have to do if they have small cut. Uh, some patients uh, engaged in the, an activity where uh, where where they are more prone for injuries, et cetera, and et cetera. So what they have to do as an immediately, and because the access to a well-established tertiary care center is, is uh, uh, it's still distant for them. Um, and also make sure that is there someone with them when you are prescribing the medications, then uh, to take care of if something goes wrong with the, those patients. Patients should be made well aware about that, uh, about the expected adverse drug reaction what they have to monitor when they are on these medications, what do what to do in case of any bleeding, lifestyle modification, extra, et cetera, et cetera. Use of technology, smartphones and applications. There are many applications available on, on Play Store and Apple Store, which monitor your medications, uh, which can also be integrated with your lab reports, scans, ECGs, and medical records. These are very helpful for, for no need to carry uh, like files and papers and papers where physicians uh, and, and the other healthcare professionals find it difficult to browse through the pages, you know, it can be very exhausting to them. So many stars, smartphones and apps have dedicated medication reminder. Patients can use to monitor their BPs, uh, which can also be shared by uh, healthcare providers. Medication label whenever dispensing from community pharmacy or hospital pharmacy, which can be given with a QR code. And also a link can be sent with the message, which can be linked to Animated videos explain the patients about the medications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, quality assurance and peer review of the information periodically is very, very essential in this because medica medicine changes, medication changes, brand changes, and the info related information also changes. So how to bill for the services? If I'm counseling, how do I have to tell that, okay, I'm providing a service and how I have to be billed? So as part of medica medication, bill can be reserved for um, uh, patient counseling services, a part of their profit. Um, in case if they have only standalone pharmacies. Research studies can be done to show insurances that effective counseling reduces hospital ED visits, which can be economical for insurance companies, and they will not mind that, and, and uh, which can be of economic value for insurance companies when they are the payers. So nominal fee can be charged for on online medication consultations. Always ask for the feedback for patient counseling services before thinking of billing the patients. So that's how you can bill slowly bill in a stepwise manner uh, whether the, the customers or the patients are willing to avail your services or not. So key takeaways of discharge medication counseling contributes significantly in increased patient well-being. Clinical pharmacists are champions of medication counseling. Efficient medication counseling involves the use of a technology. Quality enhancement is pivotal in providing sustainable model of medication counseling. Thank you. Um, I finished the presentation. If any questions, I will be glad to answer.
that was a very nice and elaborate talk mr sayed mohsin i think he over both the topics a very nice and it gave a impact on what is the role of clinical pharmacist in cardiology in cardiac emergencies and in the er or and in the counseling of the patients we do encounter a lot of situations where we have this issues of counseling and we really need a clinical pharmacist to discuss about the medications how to take that medications the side effects of those medication they don't know how long to take if you write just and people stop it in a month unless you write it properly whether to continue or to take for how long so it's very important that we have a clinical pharmacist along with us in our rounds who can explain the importance and adverse drug reactions which are very important with and they should know what are the side effects of few of these drugs so i think with this two talks i think i will move to the next session thank you dr mr sayed mohsin and what i will do is i think uh, uh, i'll move to the next session the next session is by mr ram kandelwal uh, uh, he can start his screen meanwhile i'll give a short introduction about him uh, so he is our uh, collaboration mr ram kandelwal is the founder and director of heart health india foundation a heart patient organization and ngo committed to raising public awareness providing patient support carrying out research